So I think it's about time to get going this morning. This morning we have someone I think everyone here is familiar with, uh, Dr. Mifflin, program director. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, what's going to happen in the program for the next five years. <coughs> Thanks, Jim. <coughs> uh, Alicia signed me up for this Grand Rounds, and we were thinking that we would have our accreditation results. We, we actually do have our results, which we did get a five-year accreditation. I think most of you have heard that. Um, and that's the maximum we could have gotten. But we, got, we kind of got this nebulous email notification through the RGME office that said that we were going to have to submit a progress report of some sort. So we know we didn't get a perfectly clean slate, but <coughs> the fact that we got a five year is good. And so I was gonna kind of try to specifically respond to what the ACGME gave us in terms of feedback, um, but we'll have to wait. I, 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 it'll probably be another month or so before we know. So you'll hear from me again. But so it's not so much a five-year plan responding to our accreditation review as it is um, just kind of a hopefully we'll generate some thoughts and um, healthy participation in terms of helping us direct our residency program and make it be what we want it to be. And it's kind of a fun time to do this for me because with uh, the recent application flurry and uh, interviews, it's always a good time to kind of self-assess and <coughs> kind of see what we're, we're doing well, think about what, we're, what, what, what we could do better. And so it's a good time to reflect on that. Um, I can tell a Mormon joke because I'm Mormon. It's not really a joke, but when the applicants come through, you know, I always feel anybody who knows the Mormon culture and religion, you know, it's the testimony meeting where you go and you espouse your faith. Well, when the applicants come through and I'm interviewing them, I always feel like, gosh, you know, I mean, I'm just so enthusiastic about the program and this is just such a great place. And I'm, I, you know, so that, that I, I love that time when I can just really um, promote our program. I'm really proud of our program, I'm proud of our residents, and uh, certainly um, grateful to you all for being a part of it. So in order to know where we're going, we can look back at where we've been. And it's always fun to dig up some old photos. And Paula and Glenn and Jim found some photos. So this is where we were back when I first um, became involved with the program as a medical student in 1989. And you might recognize some of these people. That's Dr. Olson with his stylish glasses. <laughs> Man of Sports, m many of you know. Dr. Harry certainly knows him. Dr. Harry might have to help. I think, the, I don't know if this is Paul Olson or who that is, but Dr. Harry probably knows some of these people. He's in one of these pictures. I was hoping Dr. Barker would be here because he looks the same as he did when he was a resident. <coughs> um, here's Alan Crandall. I don't think those are cowboy boots and no <laughs> bolo tie. Um, Mike Teske. Many of you know Maureen Lundrigan. Again, Dr. Crandall. Um, lots of faces we recognize. The late Paul Zimmerman. I think that's Rick Anderson, actually. Jane Durkin. I don't know some of these people. Jim Tweeten. Again, Mike. This is, here's Bryce. You, a lot of you have probably don't really know Dr. Barker, but he comes to Grand Rounds. He looks the same. A little bit more gray. But. And then this is kind of more when I, I knew, became familiar with the program. Um, Harold. He looks pretty similar. There's Roger. Yeah, just the same. <laughs> You're a little fuzzy in that picture. Sorry about that, Roger. So this was Dr. Olson's office in the original eye clinic and eye division. This is moving day when we're moving into the Varan 1 that uh, 
Any of you that hopefully not too many of you have gotten called to Dr. Olson's office for disciplinary matters or what have you, but it's a little different today. This was the eye clinic. And again, the late Paul Zimmerman. Um, these are some of my co-residents. And our whole eye clinic, I think there were a couple or two to three retina rooms, and then there were about five lanes back here. This was the intern room. This is where I worked, and it was, I didn't even know this till Paula was digging up some of these pictures, but this was actually a, a framed-in elevator shaft. <laughs> Might have been nice to know that when I was working in it, but... But our whole eye clinic would have fit in the atrium of this room. And some of the old, and again, this was kind of a work room, and that's actually Wayne. Um, <laughs> there. But, so that's our laser room, our high-tech laser room at the time. So then we moved into Moran 1. I had the honor, I guess, or privilege of being the first resident to actually do surgery in this building. We thought it was awesome, and it was compared to our old digs. But it wasn't ideally designed. I, I love this picture. of This was our waiting area with the exam rooms entering into the waiting area. It was chaos. And this was the parking lot where the new Moran fits. And this was always kind of fun to go over and on the bridge between primaries and the U and watch the progress. And this was the parking structure hole. And Glenn took all these pictures. I think he went over and photographed this every week at, during construction. Dr. Uh, John Moran and Dr. Olson. And now we have this beautiful facility. Um, so I just wanted to kind of acknowledge the evolution of this program and Dr. Olson's not here but I wanted to acknowledge him and his you know vision of bringing what was he was a one one man division I guess to this amazing thing that you have now so please don't take it for granted and I'm not just you know I kind of showed pictures of the physical facility but I really think it's the people that make this place great and so um, and our, our people power has grown significantly too. So, one, so just trying to set the example, well when we do grand rounds, we're supposed to have learner objectives, we're supposed to have disclosures. This is kind of a soft topic, I realize, but you can still get credit for it. Um, these are my learner objectives. Um, just to teach you all, remind you all, a little bit about residency accreditation. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the strengths and weaknesses of the program, but maybe we can have a discussion about that. And then suggest some planning for improvement. Um, part of the way that we are, the reality of the way that we're judged is our accreditation because the regulatory oversight kind of determines whether we can keep functioning. So that's an important part of how we judge ourselves and how we plan. It's probably not the most important <coughs> way to judge ourselves. but And I like this word enhancement. And I always thought that was funny when I was a refractive surgery fellow. Uh, you know, spin is everything. Spin is important, and especially when you're dealing with regulatory agencies and stuff like that. And also when you're dealing with patients. A spin, some people think about that as a bad word, but I always thought it was funny. Well, when you screwed somebody's surgery up and they didn't get the result, the desired result, and they needed a touch-up surgery, you're going to enhance them. It's not like a redo. It's not like a, you know, <laughs> we're enhancing you. So that's what we're going to do in our residency <laughs> program. When we screw up, we're just going to enhance it. And I don't have any disclosures. Most of you know what the ACGME is, but it's our over uh, site administrative um, body for residency uh, certification, and some fellowships now fall under the ACGME purview, too. The RRC, our Residency Re Review Committee, is a subcommittee within the council that is made up of mostly ophthalmologists, and the current RRC for um, ophthalmology is 
all program directors or former program directors. So it's actually a really good, just since I've been program director for about nine years, um, there's been a really good, well I guess eight years, um, trend towards the more motivated and proactive educators being involved in these committees. And we actually nominated, uh, you know, when nominations come up, I nominate our residents to try to serve on this committee too. There is a resident member as well. Um, this year our nominee was not selected, but maybe in the future. <coughs> so to be accredited, um, you have to comply with requirements or which are set by the ACGME and some of them are common across all training programs. So internal medicine, ophthalmology, general surgery, neurosurgery, et cetera, will have some common requirements. The evolution in um, the approach has been an effort to try to quantify and validate, I guess, would be a good way of saying it. And there's a lot of um, kind of bureaucratic type language that you have to sift through. But I think if you just kind of think of it in those terms, it does kind of describe what's been going on. And so the, con the requirements reflect the transition from a process-oriented reg resident education. And what that means to me or what I've come to learn about that is it means that residency education, physician education was more apprenticeship based in the past. And to some extent it still is. But instead of an educator just saying, well, I can vouch that this person is trained, in the modern era, that's not really going to fly. And as you might imagine with some really weak program, it's a little hard sometimes for us to relate to that because I think we have really strong programs. But in a, you know, if there were a really weak system, people would get trained and you know, be vouched for and maybe not be so well trained. There might be issues patient safety, et cetera. So the governing body recognized this as a problem and so there's this ongoing stepwise plan to try to make educators prove that we're actually training people the way that we're supposed to be. And the word, kind of the buzzword is outcomes. So what does that mean? <coughs> well, um, that's part of the problem. We don't really know what outcomes means. It's partly defined by us, but somehow measuring how we're training people is, is what we're trying to do. And then each specialty will have specific program requirements that are adopted or proposed by the, the review committees for that area. So some of the things that we're required to have are goals detailed objectives, um, descriptions of how we're going to assess progress. We need to have didactics. We need to allow residents to care for patients and have progressive responsibility. And we need to supervise them. And we need to measure our progress in doing all this. And then our curriculum needs to include research. Um, and this is always kind of a challenge because residency is a really busy time, 36 months of quote clinical training, but we recognize the value of research uh, as does the ACGME. <coughs> and so it's always kind of a challenge to fit that in and define what that means, you know, what is meaningful research, how do we accomplish that. But this is what the, the RRC for ophthalmology tells us is that we we need to teach residents how to do research, which I think is actually one of our weaknesses right now. I don't think we really teach residents very well how to do research. And we, ha we need to have them participate, which actually we do a pretty good job of that. And, and I think we're, we're improving in that area all the time. And then we need to allocate resources and facilitate this. Um, most of you know these these competency areas. I'm not going to really talk about these. I've belabored these in the past. Um, I don't think they really asked anybody about these at the site visit, but they could have, I guess. But they're fairly common sense. Um, 
these are things that we do need to assess and self-assess, <coughs> set goals, and um, understand the importance of them. <coughs> Excuse me. So residency for ophthalmology needs to be a 36 month program. Um, we need to teach those listed skills. Uh, we need to teach residents how to do surgery. And the goal is to have somebody um, trained and ready for practicing independently <coughs> as a comprehensive ophthalmologist without supervision. And that's pretty specific language. When, when people graduate from the program, I have to write a letter that specifically states that this person has been trained to practice independently without supervision. But as you can imagine, you know, the scope of practice can be pretty varied and it depends on the community, it depends on the trainee, it depends on a lot of things. So um, it's really kind of a moving target. And a lot of what I've learned being program director is that a lot of the um, way that we interact with the regulators is kind of a guess what I'm thinking. And so people, it's really funny because we have kind of web chats and things like that among program directors and everybody's like trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? Uh, what did you guys do for that? Oh, we were cited for that. Oh, we, you know, well, I wasn't. And, you know, so it, there's a little bit of that kind of uncertainty on what some of this language means. But I think most of us can kind of understand what it means to be a comprehensive ophthalmologist and practice independently without supervision. All of us who've completed training know that when you get out, sometimes you're I mean, you're still going to feel inadequate. You're still going to feel um, not necessarily prepared for everything that you face. And so part of what we need to teach residents is how to deal with that, that issue, you know, deal with how do you get help, how, when, you know, when you refer, all that kind of stuff. And, and so my experience, and I think, you know, others could comment too, is that you really learn a lot more once you get out, actually because, you know, it's all on you at that point. And, um, but this is our goal anyway. Another thing that we kind of, it's kind of hard to do sometimes because you have individuals who may be stronger or weaker or have different interests is try to ensure an equivalent experience for all residents. And, and uh, that sometimes, I don't know if that's something that, you know, that the review committee looked at in our, our review or not, we, we've kind of tried to make our program a little more adaptive and a little more flexible in terms of elective time, in terms of letting residents kind of pursue their, their interests. Um, so we're not always perfectly equivalent, we realize that, and it will be interesting to see if that's something that they notice. Um, the, the number of outpatient visits and um, consultations and things like that, I mean, we probably ex exceed those by a factor of 10, maybe, maybe not quite that much, but um, certainly access to patients is not a problem in this program, and certainly as the first years can attest to, they get plenty of consultations as well. And then interestingly, because I think it's a weakness in a lot of places or traditionally was, pathology is specifically expressed as a requirement. Didactics, again, I'm sure you can all vouch for the fact that you do way more than that, probably more than you want to, and then conferences as well are important. We need to provide facilities at each of our training institutions. And a newer requirement is that we actually need to, um, and many of you current residents, probably in medical school, you you kind of grew up in the area, era of simulation, but it really wasn't something that my generation had at all. I mean, we just didn't have um, things. But this is a this is recognized as an important area of training, and you know, just like I guess a, one of the models would be, you know, flight simulators for pilots. It just makes sense that you would do simulated experiences for medical trainees where there might be a lot at stake. So. Um, most of you have heard, and but maybe some haven't, but we actually, through the generous donation of Paul Zimmerman's estate and some fundraising that we're doing, we 
are going to be able to get a surgical simulator, the ISI surgical simulator, and we hope to have that in place and up and going by in June. So uh, that'll be a really nice thing. And we've really tried to respond to this requirement by beefing up our wet lab experience and things like that. So as compared to when Dr. Barlow was here as a first and second year resident, we're doing a lot more of that now. So hopefully that's helping. And then we were required to teach in these areas which are specifically delineated. We're very happy in our program to have faculty covering all of these areas. We do have plans to recruit and retain an ocular plastics person. In terms of turnover and succession, things like that, I don't really know of any anticipated faculty changes in the work. We need to assess what the trainees are learning um, in, you know, kind of obvious areas, knowledge, exam, um, technical skills, decision making, documentation, <coughs> surgery. So really the my job is to try to figure out what we need to teach with the assistance of all of you and our committee, our academic committee is highly involved in this. Our residents have actually been highly involved. And then try to design the curriculum, evaluate how it's working and modify it, improve, adapt. And I think we're the biggest challenge because it's a busy residency. I always tell the applicants one of our greatest strengths is one of our greatest weaknesses. It's a really busy residency, so it's a doing residency. It's hands-on. And it seems, it seems um, counterproductive sometimes to, to do these last, maybe even all of these last three things because we're busy doing, we're learning, it's exciting, we're taking care of patients, but it's really important to do the last third. And that's just the age that we live in now. I mean, this is not going to go away. Um, just like, well, I don't know. I don't want to point anybody out here, but Dr. Hatch isn't quite as young as me. So in Dr. Hatch's era, it's like it was the paternalistic area of medicine or era of medicine. If you look at some of the charts, I'm sure not his, but you know some of his peers from those days, there wasn't much written in the chart. And it was kind of like, well, this is, I'm the doctor and you know what I say goes. And now, you know, I don't know at least the last 10 years, and certainly in my uh, generation of training, if it's not documented, it's not done. And that's only getting more, more um, intense in, as you guys train. So now, not only do we have to document in the medical record, but we have to, we have all these other outcome <coughs> measures. And so we had a faculty meeting, um, I guess it was just earlier this month, where we were all kind of graded on our patient satisfaction responses. And they put up a slide anonymously, you know, thankfully, and uh, said, well, you know, these are the people that are doing it great, and these are people that really suck, and how can we help the people that really suck? And, and you know, that's the reality of, of, of our era, is that we, not, we need to be um, documenting things, will be measured in a lot of different ways. And I'm not going to go into these, but there are a lot of tools that we use to, to measure things. And I would just challenge you guys as residents to take some ownership. Certainly the faculty know about these. But try to make sure that you are getting assessed. Take, you know, take an active role in determining. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. Of, of, you know, it's your job to make sure your residency is the best it can be and that you can prove that you can do all these things and that you're getting the learning that you want to want to get. And I think some of these tools you'll find will be helpful in doing that. So our accreditation process, we just went through this. Our, our um, site visit was in July, but it was literally a kind of about a three-year process of getting ready for this. And it starts with, an, I didn't put this on here, but an internal review by our own 
GME office and director. And we actually got pretty good reviews in our internal review. There wasn't a lot to respond to. Some concerns about surgical curriculum and glaucoma, you know, it's just kind of been an area of partly because of the demographics of our patient population. It's just been a challenge to really do as much glaucoma surgery here as some of the other programs in the country. But overall, our internal review was pretty strong. Um, in the past, our, our documentation of our residency strengths and um, improvements has been less than ideal in terms of this program information form. So many of you actually got to look at this, I think, because some of the residents have had a lot of the faculty work on it. And so we really spent a lot of time in trying to improve that, this, this um, accreditation round, and I think that paid off for us. Our site visitor was really pleased and didn't find much wrong with that. And then at the, at the site visit, the, the, um, the visitor, site visitor, is typically an educator. Uh, our guy this time was a uh, former program director for pediatric orthopedics and was actually a pretty experienced uh, site visitor and was very um, commonsensical and practical. Um, our last site visit, we had a uh, PhD educator um, who really didn't know anything about ophthalmology and um, it was much more difficult. So again, I think that's part of the challenge is that you're all, you, you never quite know what you're gonna be, what standard you'll be judged by. But anyway, this time it was, it was somebody who really seemed, it seemed very relevant to it, the process and um, I think that was helpful. And then thanks to all of you for interacting with this guy and hopefully being honest but also promoting our excellent program. And then the report is filed and the committee met earlier this month and again, we received a five-year, so. Um, we knew that the areas that the RRC for ophthalmology, and I'll tell you just a little bit, this I know is somewhat boring, but I think it's good to know how this works. How the RRC works, are there, I think there are seven people on the ophthalmology uh, committee, including one resident. Um, each program application is reviewed by two, only two of the committee members and then presented to the committee for a vote. So again, there's a fair amount of subjectivity possible. I'm sure that they're, you know, try to be objective in their training, but, but um, I went to kind of a focus group at the AUPO meeting, which is the meeting of chair, chairman and program directors last January. And this RRC committee sat in front of us and let us ask them questions. And, but they identified these areas are, are as areas where they, these are areas they felt were really important in determining the quality of a residency. And these are areas that they were looking at to try to determine how many years of accreditation to get, um, to give to each program. And again, you have this kind of nebulous concept of outcome measures. So, and that's kind of left up to the programs. It's not really well spelled out what that means. So those are some of the areas that we tried to work on for our accreditation process. Um, just to review the work hours thing, that was one of the problem, one of the issues on there, work hours violations, which are a big concern in residency education, not so much in uh, ophthalmology, thankfully, but. So I just wanted to throw that up there again so everybody knows what those are. I think all the residents pretty much know what they are. Um, the only big change really in the new work hours effective this academic year is that um, this, it used to be kind of 24 plus six, um, a little bit more stringent requirements of time off between shifts. And then the interns know that uh, 16 hour shift limits for interns. We've always kind of had the rule, the ophthalmology review com or the RRC and our own program have had the rule for many years that PGY1 residents are not allowed to take home call. It's just felt that they, well, and I mean, this work hour rule would, the 
exclude that anyway, but even before that, we weren't, we weren't allowing it. We just don't really have enough experience to do that. One thing that was nice is clarification of shift kind of separation and the, sh the time off between shifts is important to clarify because when you're taking home call, um, that doesn't really count for the shift rule unless you just are, you stay in the hospital like Jim Bell, because when he's on call, we know that he has the blackest cloud anybody's had for a while. He pretty much just stays in the house because he knows he's going to be there the whole time. So Jim, we need to look at your work hours. But for most of you, and this is a question that came up and the RRC guy said, I think it was the chair of the RRC said, yeah, if a resident goes home and has a bowl of cereal for 15 minutes, that's considered a shift break, you know, and it doesn't count. So, and it, otherwise it would be unworkable because, y you know, call can be busy and you have to come in and if you had to separate that two or three hour visit. Um, now, I just want to say a little bit about fatigue because we definitely need to be aware of fatigue and sleep deprivation and things of this. So, we've always tried to promote and I think all of, well, I know all of you have completed the sleep deprivation, you know, module that if you're too tired to work, you need to let us know and we'll be excused. Arrangements will be made. Um, surgical logs, we, we kind of understand this concept of minimum numbers. This was changed a little bit last year for refractive and retina. And I don't have a slide reflecting this, but we this has been subdivided somewhat in, for example, in terms of glaucoma lasers. We don't just count all lasers now. We need to count a certain amount of um, um, you know, iridotomies versus SLTs. And so it, in a way, it's, it's good, actually. It's better to track individual procedures. So you all deserve a pat on the back. We got a five-year accreditation. We don't have the details, as I mentioned above, but um, right when I became program director, we, we had an accreditation that was basically happening. We actually only got a three-year in that county. Our next one was a four-year and now five. So let's keep it at five. And one of the things that I had to do to prepare for the um, accreditation process was to try to figure out what outcome projects were, you know, what were some outcome measures or measurements for our residency. And so I kind of took to heart that uh, we knew that surgical numbers was going to be important for our program because we were excited on that actually for our glaucoma surgical numbers at our last review. Um, we kind of intuitively knew that ward pass rates and things like that were important, but we decided right after our last accreditation that we would, it just kind of made sense to, well, you know, an outcome is where do, the, where do our graduates end up? How do they feel about our program? Um, you know, how is our program viewed among? So we've kind of collected this data um, and this was actually summarized and presented as part of our um, accreditation application. So our surgical numbers, some of you saw that, I, one of you needs to teach me how to copy a page from PDF and get it in here. But this, this was from last year, actually, well, this was 2009, 2010. Again, our glaucoma, our glaucoma filtering and tubes and stuff has actually gone up. We were at 46 percentile. Glaucoma lasers is still low. Now I'll show you at the very end the numbers in kind of the trends for our surgical numbers, and actually they look pretty good. The, the last year was actually a really good year, but we, need, we do need to try to continue and maintain the gain. And, you know, we're, uh, this is a reflects our VA thing. I mean, we're typically not that low in cataract surgery percentile-wise, but I'll show you kind of a time trend at the very end. But certainly our surgical stats are um, even though we really, it's funny, we have a reputation still of being incredibly high surgical volume, but we've certainly dropped some relative to other programs. Um, we used to always be, you know, 98th percentile in cataract surgery and things like that. We're still pretty high, but so this is something, 
just it's it's an objective thing that you can look at. Board pass rate. So I, I went through and tried to, along with some other educators, um, there was actually a publication on this from Dr. Oding in Iowa. But we, and there, some of it was collaborative stuff, and I did send in our, anonymously, of course, our numbers for that publication that they came up with. But it's a little hard to correlate exam score numbers because of the small number, you know, statistically. We have three, you know, for a long time, two graduates every year, three graduates per year now. But our, the written qualifying examination, you take that basically your year after residency complete. And it's similar to OCAPS, pretty similar. And so our first time failure rate, and this was just a five year summary that the American Board of Ophthalmology sends to us was 23%. And that's compared to a national average of 20%. So that's an area where we can improve. Now, again, it trends because, you know, you have a cluster of a couple of people who don't pass, then it really drags the rate down because the numbers are really low. Contrast it with our oral exam rate, which was nobody didn't pass for the last five years. And I do think that there may be some correlation. I think our oral exam rates actually have improved, but again, because the numbers are small, it's going to take m multiple years to decide that. But we kind of feel like our oral, our mock orals have kind of helped our, our graduates with the oral boards. And then I looked at all of the, all of the data that I actually had that I could find, which was about 10 years worth, um, both oral and written boards we have a 14.3% um, fail first time failure rate compared to about 20 to 25% for US graduates national average. So um, every graduate from our program has actually passed on the second and one person had to take uh, the oral boards three times to pass, but everybody's passed. I don't know if they've changed the rule, but it used to be if you passed the third time, you had to start over. Or I mean, if you failed the third time, you had to start over. I, I'm looking at Nick because I don't. I, I think that's still. No, I think you do have to go back and do written again if you failed the third time. So thankfully, that person passed. But so overall, our program's doing well compared to the national average, and we have never really emphasized. I mean, uh, last couple of years, we've kind of made more of a push to try to tr try to promote good performance on OCAPs, but we've not really pushed this historically, but we've done pretty well. OCAPs, I mean, this kind of reflects the lack, I think, of a push really to do well on OCAPs, but um, I looked at all of the OCAP data I could find for our program, and there were a couple of years that were missing. I don't know. The scores come to Dr. Olson, and this was actually before I was program director, but we had a few years where they were actually missing, so I didn't have all the years, but um, tried to do some kind of a statistical analysis. I mean, nothing panned out. The only thing that really panned out is that every person who failed their written, well, there, there was actually one or two, I think, that who failed their written OCAPs actually had scores above 20, but this is a, this is a, this is a bad indicator. If you score below 20, 20th percentile on OCAPs, there's a pretty high chance that you'll fail written boards. So that was really the only thing I could glean from OCAPs. And I think part of that is because some people don't study for it. They just say, well, I'm just going to go into it cold and see what I learn. And I think, or see what I know. I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I mean, I think there might be some value to that. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, we've had third years. We've definitely had third years in our program who have not studied for OCAPs. And then they've done great on their written qualifying exam. I don't think any of them have gotten to the 20th percentile and passed. Uh, so that's just kind of, it, it's a way maybe to assess yourself. Now, the pass rate for um, written qualifying exam varies by year because sometimes the test is harder than others. But around 30 to 33 percent is usually what you, you have to get to, to pass. So that's actually below 
the threshold of passing that 20th percentile. Um, fellowships was another thing we wanted to look at. And I was kind of surprised when I, when I actually, we haven't really tabulated this, but we've had a lot of people go into fellowships in the last 10 years. And um, this is Utah, so, you know, it's kind of inbred, because if you look, a lot of these fellows are, are staying here. But we feel like our fellowship programs are competitive with anywhere, and it's not a diss to our residents. I mean, we're many times our fellows are kept here because they're the best applicants. It's not because they have some kind of a pipeline, but we turn out stellar residents. So, but anyway, I thought that was, I thought that was, that, that was actually good. And I, I actually don't have any data on what, you know, other programs do, but I think this is comparable or certainly probably better than average. The other thing is jobs are, are usually, um, our residents are sought after for good jobs. Uh, every year I get calls from people saying, you know, so-and-so is thinking about retiring. Do you have any good residents coming up through the ranks that we can recruit and talk to? And so <coughs> this place has a reputation of turning out graduates who can actually function, who've achieved that level of competency that we talked about where they can actually practice and do surgery and do a good job. <coughs> Our residency applications have, you know, kind of, I mean, we had a little plateau maybe in 2007 through 2009, but we've kind of gone up, up and up and up, much to Alicia's delight. She just loves processing them all, much to Dr. Warner's delight, because I think she looks at every single one. Um, and uh, so it's an, thank you, Dr. Warner. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Elaine. Um, but I think, one of the things that, again, is heartening for me is to see these applicants come, and they're very excited about our programs, and many of them are super strong applicants, and they um, have interviewed elsewhere, and hopefully they're not just ground-nosing when they give us, you know, positive reviews and say, you know, you really do have a good residency. I, I'm sure that at least some of them are sincere. Um, another thing that we looked at in terms of our outcome projects is our surveys. Again, that was on that list of hot button items that the RRC wanted to, to uh, take into account. Um, our ACGME surveys, you've all done those now, I think. Uh, Brian hasn't done it, but all the residents have done it. Um, you know, I think looking back at about the last three or four years, uh, these are some trends of potential concerns that have come up. These are all kind of responded to at a low frequency. I think at the most, you know, probably, uh, I think the 2008, 2009 survey, and as you know, they're not perfectly constructed or worded, so there's some opportunity for misreading or error, but concerns about fellows somehow interfering, you know, kind of that love-hate relationship with fellows. They teach me a lot, they're great, they, you know, I can call on them, they support me when I'm on call, but yeah, I think there would be more cases if they weren't here. So that's a concern that, you know, I think it's a valid concern and residents were honest about expressing that. And that's, that's one of our challenges as we go forward is how to balance that. Um, there were concern, some concerns on the recent survey about confidentiality of board OCAP scores and also maybe evaluations. And I think part of that was, you know, we met about some of these things. I think part of that was a communication issue as much as anything. Um, not sure that there are any real major issues with that anymore, but it's something that we're going to continue to watch. Um, supervision, one resident said, man, I'm not supervised. I'm not sure what to do with that because I don't think it's not my experience, but I, I was a little worried about that one, but I was unable to get specific on that. Work hours, similar, some outlier responses that weren't ever really, well, really only one resident, so it's always kind of hard to know if, a, if the question was misread or mismarked or whatever, but these two are going to, I mean, these, these could actually trigger some kind of, you know, response from the ACGME because they're you know, kind of egregious because we absolutely must not violate these things. Residents need to be supervised. If they say they're not being supervised, that's really bad. 
um, work hours, you know, they don't have a high tolerance for allowing work hours violations that aren't addressed. Um, this was another one, kind of like the fellow thing. I realize research is not the primary mission of the clinical training residency program, but it's important. I want to do it. I need you to support me in doing it. And but I think all of the responses and, you know, they're, they're actually very understandable from, you know, people all want to do more research. They all want time and support to do that. And, um, again, it's one of those challenges that we have to kind of figure out. Surgical experience, same thing. You know, everybody wants to do more surgery. Didactics, um, some valid concerns, which I think have been, for the most part, improved, but we're always, we always want more input and we want your feedback. Um, so we actually did our own uh, survey monkey survey. We've done this for about five years now here, and these are the questions we asked because I was worried about this outcome thing. It's like, what do they mean? I have no idea what they mean. So, well, let's ask mm -hmm. our graduates. So, so we asked them if they were satisfied with their experience. Again, I wrote the survey, so it's inherently flawed. But, you know, we just tried to get some ideas. Did my residency prepare me for a fellowship or practice? Could I, was I prepared for the boards? How was my surgical training? Would I recommend this? And um, as you can imagine, the response rate wasn't perfect. We got different levels of response. Uh, last year, I had Elaine send it to, um, I think, the recent five-year graduates to try to survey everybody because we had small numbers to start with. But, you know, at least initially and when we surveyed people on their exit from residency, satisfaction rate was really high. I think as they got further from training, they might have, and then that's why, like, for example, this was only one respondent hadn't taken boards yet, so I didn't really know what to say, but, you know, as they got a little bit further out, there were some people who were, you know, 10%, 18%, maybe didn't respond favorably to some of these categories, and then there were some neutral responses, too. Uh, these are all the favorable, like, um, excellent or very good responses, the neutrals weren't included in this, so. So we have a few people who, you know, I mean, I think it, hopefully that validates the survey a little bit. There are some concerns. You know, some of our graduates are not feeling adequately prepared for uh, the written qualifying exam. It is kind of interesting again, though, and I think, thank you, Jason, for, you know, 100%, even in this larger group, so that they were better prepared for oral exams. So I think that's an example of how our mock boards have you know, it's something that we've done to change our residency that's actually maybe improved our outcomes. So we have some things to work on. In spite of all of that, um, well, and, and again, we had, you know, some people who weren't totally happy recommending our residency, and that, you know, to me that's concerning. I want to see that number be 100%. Uh, these are some sub subjective comments, and we won't take a lot of time reading those, but kind of just reflect what was on the, the numerical thing. Some people want more surgery, some people have concerns about didactics, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we changed the survey, unfortunately we didn't get, we didn't make it friendly to get um, written comments the last year we did it, so we need to change it back to where we get written comments. So. In terms to of you know a five-year plan of how how to respond to our ACGM review, I don't really have a specific one because we don't have the specifics of how we did. We know we did well, but we don't have anything that we can actually respond to. But one of the things that I want to convey is that um, part of this competency stuff is, you know, I think it can drag us down a little bit if we're just satisfied with being competent and not try always trying to be the best we can be. And um, for both faculty and residents, it's important to understand if it's not documented, it didn't happen, so that means for skills, that means for all the stuff you're supposed to be doing. And you really need to be proactive in trying to help us collect that data. And I think in a big institution, we really have to worry about what I call the lowest common denominator phenomenon. Well, I've met my minimum level, so I'm good. You know, I'm going to go golfing or whatever. Not that golf is bad, but I think each of us needs to set a goal to improve, constantly improve. 
and we may end up at different levels, but if we're always trying to improve, we're going we're gonna to be where we want to be. So one of the things that specifically I think we need to work on as a residency is promoting balance in the surgical experience, and we need to set some specific goals, which we have for glaucoma. And, uh, and again, it's not a reflection on our glaucoma faculty. They're not here, but you know, I'm going to defend them. Well, Jason's here. Um, it's, it's, I think it's more a reflection of our practice patterns and population. But the ACGME doesn't care about that. I got away with kind of justifying and explaining away that on our fifth this time. I don't think that's going to work five years from now. So we need to somehow improve our training. It may be through simulation. It may be through wet labs. It may be through some of the stuff we're already doing. But that's an area we need to target specifically. Uh, we need to think about this fellow thing and how to maybe improve the balance. And we might not want to solve that one today, but maybe that's something that the residents can meet with myself and Jeff on and decide if there are things that we can do. I think a really th important thing that all of the faculty need to do, and maybe sometimes senior residents can help with this, is manage expectations. You know, junior residents are more likely to be disgruntled because their life isn't always fun for them when they're on consult service and they're taking more call and so it's nice if the more senior guys can put their arm around them guys and gals say hey you know what I'm doing a ton of surgery thanks a lot for slogging away at the VA through that <laughs> clinic you know and uh, or you know same thing for research you know sometimes it's just not it's just not realistic to be able to have a lab and a you know research assistant and dedicated time during the day. I mean, that's just not what residency is about. So part of my job and all of our job is to manage, same thing, you know, you gotta, you gotta slog, you gotta serve, you gotta grind at the VA to get patients, you gotta to get experience. I mean, we have to, we have to be better at managing our expectations on this. I mean, one of the things, again, that comes through in interviewing, well, I interview a lot of fellow applicants, obviously, for cornea, and, and we have a really strong cornea fellowship, and we get people from great places, and they just say, gosh, I mean, you guys have it so good here, the techs are cracked, and, you know, I mean, you know, we, you don't have this indigent hospital where you're seeing 90 patients in a half day, and you, you know, you don't have any supervision, and so I think we, we need to work to manage expectations, and I think that'll actually improve our satisfaction rate. It's not that these things don't need to be changed necessarily. They can be improved, but part of it is just managing expectations. I also think we can do a better job of mentoring residents, and I really want the residents to kind of try to be proactive on this. You, you, you don't have perspective to know where you should be going and what you should be doing when you're a first-year resident. And you really need a partnership with with faculty to do that. Some of you have done it very successfully. I think others kind of get, they're just under the radar and nobody's really finding them and helping them. Um, research, is, it's improving and you know our publication rate is much better than it was five or even you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago. So we're, we're doing well, but we need to maintain our game. And then this one I is for the residents is just, you know, I think owning this as a resident, as a trainee, what do I need to know for my career? What's my role? And can I, am I participating in proving that I'm ready? And if you guys will do that, that'll make everybody's job easier. And you need to push the faculty on that. Because I know a lot of times you print off your form. Even in my clinic, you come up and we're super busy and we don't fill it out. But somehow just kind of being persistent, be the nagging person until it gets done. Um, my biggest concern, I'm put the laser pointer, Jason's not paying attention, is this. Because we depend so heavily on the VA, my number one goal the next two years is to somehow improve our predictability quotient with the VA. We have to somehow get more um, security in our contracting, in our agreements, whatever. I mean, I'm going to work, I'll just promise you guys I'll do whatever I can to try to promote that, knowing that I may have no power. I know Jason and I both at times feel helpless because despite all we do, and we depend so heavily on the VA, you know, sometimes we just can't 
make any inroads with the administration. I mean, it's just there are funding issues, there are hard-headedness issues, there are a lot of political issues, so it's, it's tough. But that's, I, that's my biggest concern. And then just, I think this is one that we all need to be aware of. I don't uh, totally understand millennials. There are different um, values to some extent. There are different expectations for what the role, our role should be. And, um, and that's something that's changing, you know. A position nowadays isn't the same as a position um, even from when I trained. And I think balance is important. Family's important. Recreation's important. The reality may just be that we're going to become more shift worker type professionals or whatever, but somehow we need to um, kind of hang on to what, you know, what's best about our profession, and that's a, you know, special privilege that we have to take care of patients, and, you know, it's really, it's more than a job, and uh, that's something that, you know, I, I don't know, that hopefully that we can continue in our residency to promote that. And I think a lot of people who go into medicine just inherently have that desire to serve and do their best and sacrifice to some extent in their, you know, in their role as a physician. But it is something that is changing a bit, and, you know, we need to be aware of that. So we don't have much time, a couple minutes, but I'm happy to answer questions. Actually, we're out of time. Um, you know out your ideas definitely would love to meet again with the residents there's such a flurry coming you know into the accreditation process and it's like this you know sigh of relief that we have our you know our goal was achieved and uh, but we still need to we need to be proactive um, I know some of the chiefs their glaucoma numbers aren't what I want them to be I mean we need to focus on these things we need to we need to kind of keep going so any comments Questions? All right. Thank you. See, it's kind of one of these bureaucracy. That's a perfect example of the lowest common denominator right. scenario yeah. where we have, you know, I don't know how many, 25 specialties right. trying to use the same system. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. But we're going we're to use Epic. Epic, is, no other way Epic, is, Epic is it. And yeah. we, the ophthalmology, we decided to be one of the last people to do it because we're not happy with the product. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, 10 years ago. 12 years ago, I was on the EMR committee, and we were looking at next gen and you know all these. Uh, it's 